What's up, guys? If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Also, please smash that like button on the video and enjoy the show. There are people that say there are four forces of nature. There's electricity and magnetism. That's one force. Now, it used to be two force. Now it's one force. There's something called the weak nuclear force. This is responsible for radioactive decay. So when a, when mm. a neutron decays and shoots off an electron, a neutrino, antineutrino, and, um, and a proton, those uh, objects are, par are part of what's called weak nuclear decay. Okay. Then there's a strong force of electromagnetism. Uh, sorry, a strong force of the nucleus, which is responsible. You ever think of like how does uh, I don't think most people think about this, but helium has two protons in its nucleus. And never two, thought about two that neutrons. In my life. <laughs> you never get. Well, we're going to see the the Macy's Day Parade soon. So <laughs> think, when you see the helium balloon, think about the fact that helium has two protons in its nucleus. Okay. What do you know about uh, like charges, Julian? Not much. Assume nothing. <laughs> Like charges repel. Uh, what do you know about opposites? Oh, I thought you said light charges. No, no, no. Not like. Like, okay. like. Yeah, they yeah. repel. Opposites they repel. attract. So how does this yeah. proton, how do these two protons stick together? They're both positively charged. We would have to break that mold. Well, you'd have to have some other force that's stronger mm. than the electrostatic repulsion between two like charges. And that's called the strong force. It indeed exists. Then there's the fourth force, which you're very familiar with because you're, you know, you're jacked, right? And it's <laughs> called gravity. So you're working against gravity. You go to the gym. You do uh, what have the question is, can we unify more of those forces? So we already unified electricity and magnetism into one force. So we basically reduced five forces to four forces. Then they reduced another force in the 60s and 70s. One of my past guests, uh, Sheldon Glashow, inspiration for young Sheldon on the, you know, the Big Bang Theory. Oh, shit, really? Yeah. Um, so he's a Nobel laureate up in Boston. He and his colleagues, Steven Weinberg and Abdus Salam, they uh, invented a way to unify together the weak nuclear force with the electric and magnetic force, and that's called electroweak theory. So mm. now we've reduced five forces down to two, down to three, electroweak, and then gravity and the strong nuclear force. Okay. Now the question is, can you unify the strong nuclear force with the electroweak force? That's called grand unified theory. Mm. If those were shown to be the manifestation of one single force, then you'd have two left. Guess what we'd want to do next? Unify a strong plus electroweak with gravity. That's called mm. the theory of everything. That, in some sense, is the unification that Eric attempts to achieve and that string theory attempts to achieve. So they're trying to achieve the ultimate unification. But wait, there's a problem. It would be like we built the second and third floor of this penthouse apartment here, but we never <laughs> built the basement or the first floor. Mm. In other words, we have not yet come to an agreement or any testable theory for what's called grand unification, abbreviation, gut. So I always joke, back to my hilarious joke. Yeah, the toe before the gut. Putting the toe before the gut. And I do that on a scale because I can't look down. But, <laughs> but if you look at these phenomena, why is there an obsession with this? And I think it's because of what your past guest, Michio, said. If you could get this equation Perhaps one inch long. I'm going to try to yeah. channel Michio. Perhaps one inch long. <laughs> it could take you to the top. You would then have known and knowledge of the mind of God. Yes. That's why he calls it that. But wait a second. How can you know the mind of God if you don't know his like pecs and his, and his uh, cranium? Because <laughs> you don't have the gut. You mm. don't have the gut, Michio. So why are you doing that? Why? Because what did he say inspired him the most? On this very chair, in this very type of studio when you Einstein. were done. He said Einstein. He said when he died, he knew, noted that Einstein had on his desk a piece of paper and he was working so hard and it was to come up with this theory of everything. It's not really what he was doing. He certainly wasn't doing string theory. That's what he was referring to it as. Yeah. More than anything. Yeah. I mean, it was his, it was his holy grail, yes. his promised land. And Michio wanted to not take over, well, we don't have a grand unified theory. If Michio had come up as, as an age, whatever he was when Einstein died, I want to be a theoretical physicist and understand how to unify together the strong nuclear force with the electromagnetic force, he would have won probably multiple Nobel Prizes and also did what Einstein didn't do. But because of this allure of being the next Einstein and so forth, people like him and, and others have built up people like Ed Witten into these superhuman intellects that almost too much is invested in for it to not be right. And that's there's no evidence for it. That was the guy that Eric was in, in that same sit down with Joe Rogan when he talked about Michio. Witten was the guy who he was like, I am so intimidated by this yeah, man he's right. so smart or he's whatever and but he hasn't he's voldemort he's he's another guy who's smack in the middle of of defending string theory 
Well, he's one of the foremost, you know, progenitors of of one of the closest and key insights of string theory, which is originally the string theory had twenty six dimensions. I would say, can we like, break it down for people? Uh, yeah, so string theory uh, is a mathematical uh, conception that attempts to do. Uh, a unification of quantum mechanics, which is the theory of the atomic world and the realm of the electrons and protons and crew no, the electrons and neutrons and so forth, and their con constituent particles, including things like quarks, and then uh, and then combine them in a uh, unification schema to make them compatible with gravity, to have a particle of gravity effectively that acts on the space, this very esoteric mathematical space. And for technical reasons, you can't do it in the ordinary world of three-dimensional space that you and I love and enjoy, mm -hmm. combined with time. So time plus space is called space-time. It is a network of points, mathematically, arbitrarily speaking, that you, there is not enough space, so to speak. There's not enough degrees of freedom to have all the particles come together and manifest a gravity with the particles of charge, electromagnetism, the yeah. particles of the weak force, and the particles of the strong force in four dimensions. So they go below it. They go a layer They go above it. it. They, they, they say, actually, the space in which things are happening is not four dimensional. We see four-dimensional space, just like we don't see the effects of protons, neutrons, oh, and electrons. Okay, yeah. Continue. But we will, see, we will see the macroscopic manifestation of, uh, of particles. We see their collective behavior. We can't see their individual behavior. They will say you can't even see the individual behavior of the dimensions because they're, they're so sm much smaller. Their, their size scales in which they operate are so far removed from our observability. That That's what I was talking about. Yeah. Go lower with yeah. the size. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So, so you're effectively uh, talking about uh, uh, what are different schemes called compactification and so forth. So you have more than the four dimensions. Now the question is, is it five dimensions? There were theories. In other words, you could have a theory that would have quantum mechanics and magnetism and electricity, uh, and that actually could work in a certain sense if space-time had five dimensions. Mm. Um, so if you added one more dimension, it's kind of you'd have like an electromagnetic dimension, and you can almost see this with things like there are birds, or, or here's a good thing: like there there's three properties to light. Like we're in this room, there's a certain color of light, there's a certain intensity of light, mm -hmm. and there's something called polarization which is the least familiar property of light, which is how the waves of electricity and magnetism are marching up and down, left and right, or not at all, okay? Yeah, I never thought about that building this. Yeah, thought about the first two. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, it's totally unfamiliar because yeah. we don't have sensors to detect that. Bees do. Bees do, and there are certain crystals that can have the sense, and birds do. So they can navigate. They, there are certain navigational properties that nature has embodied them to involve to have, such that they can navigate using the, the not just the color and intensity of the sun, but actually when the sun is down, hmm. they'll be able to navigate based on the polarization of the light waves. But anyway, if you add another dimension, our eyes to our eyes capability, and, and actually then we could see this phenomena, it would be like, yeah, we're adding an extra dimension to space-time. So we'd have, we'd have super uh, what do they call that? Extrasensory perception, yeah. the sixth sense. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so we don't have that. And for, I mean, technically, there's a tiny amount in certain people. But, but anyway, the mo average person doesn't have it. So, when you uh, think about what they had to do, they had to say, well, well, what is the uh, minimum number of additional properties of the universe that you'd have to add, such that it could manifest the properties that you do want, which is to have quantum mechanics and gravity play together nicely and all operate as one single equation, one single force field. And that was found to be originally 26. You need 26 different dimensions of space, and then these, these abstract spaces that we can't, by definition, access because we're, we exist in three dimensions. Mm. And even particles of light only travel in three dimensions of space and one in time. So you'd have to have some other way to access these dimensions. And, and then the, obser the immediate observations, we don't see any of these dimensions. So there must be either way too big for us to see. And, uh, we're just these tiny little ants on the surface of a donut, and we don't know that the donut is curving in this direction or that direction. Or the um, or it's the opposite. We're these enormous macroscopic creatures, and actually the space-time is curved on these phenomenally infinitesimally small dimensions of 10 to the minus 30th centimeters that we can also not access. We can't detect them. We, there's no properties of particle accelerators. There's no microscope that can zoom in, as you say, to see them. Now, what Witten did is he realized that there was a way to reduce that number from 26 to 11, and then it was reduced to 10 dimensions. How? Um, so this is truly beyond even my mathematical, you know, uh, concepts. But, uh, but effectively, as, as I understand it, 
the compactification was a recognition that they're the instantiation of these particles, the, the properties of particles or the properties of these strings, they didn't need to be have at that many dimensions, the original number of dimensions. And so this was uh, basically what won him the Fields Medal. There's no Nobel Prize in mathematics. The closest mm -hmm. thing is, is called the Fields Medal, and it's, it's awarded to people under 40 for the greatest contribution uh, to mathematics. And he won it for physics, basically, for, this, for these kind of uh, laws and understanding how you could reduce the dimensionality down to a more tractable number. I always say, like, over the summer, there was this big brouhaha with um, you know, the Joe Rogan and Elon Musk uh, got all involved with, which is that this, this new study confirms or says the universe is 26 billion years old. Oh, yeah. And I talked about this with Joe on his show, and it's really one guy who I know. He's a nice guy in Canada. And he came out with some model that seems to suggest that, yeah, in certain circumstances, you could, you could have a universe that's older. It would be needed to be older in order to explain the properties of galaxies that are much, much younger or too young in a universe that's only 13 billion years old. And for people following out there, we basically go up the scale, solar system, galaxy, universe. So yeah. he's looking at the whole shebang. Clusters and galaxies and between yes. that and then the universe. Yes. So he was looking at, really, as you look back in space, you're looking back in time. So light, mm. you, uh, the only good thing about you know the, using imperial units of feet and so forth is that light travels one foot every nanosecond. So I'm seeing you, you're three feet away. I'm seeing you not as you are instantaneously right now, I'm seeing you three nanoseconds ago. You look very young and very vital and very healthy, <laughs> um, but, uh, but it's not instantaneous. So as you look back to the curtains behind you, those are six feet away. So it's six nanoseconds. You keep going, go past you know, New Jersey, Manhattan, go all the way back to the, the center of the Milky Way, go beyond the Milky Way, go to the local supercluster. Eventually, you're going to get back to where there's nothing in your way. No buildings, no planets, no asteroids, no galaxies. And there you're seeing back to when the earliest galaxies themselves are being formed, if they exist. Mm. And what, he, what this uh, Rajendra Gupta at University of Ottawa said was, well, based on my calculations, one person's calculations, you know, bolstered by, you know, he didn't make any errors or blunders, but he sort of came to the conclusion that the universe had to be much older. We'll talk about that later because that is okay. a, a, a proper controversy that we can discuss. Um, there are others that say the universe is infinitely old. So he's, even though it's twice the age of the accepted universe that Gupta has come up with, it's still a hell of a lot, you know, younger than an infinitely old universe that this other guy, Eric Lerner, had come up with about a year before that. Thank you for watching the video, guys. Please hit that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.